Pass. <laughs> all on the same note, guys. Right. Okay. I start. You need to go up an octave. Okay. Part 3 I object Our inquiry question What are the major objections to the ontological arguments? Doing part four, wrong. No, this is part three. Is it? Right then, so the <laughs> criticisms <laughs> <Yeah>. on the ball. <laughs> Ollie's brought his thinking out with him. Come on, Ollie. Oh, no. We're on part three. No, we've done part three. No, we haven't. We haven't done part three. Come on. We're on the criticisms. And we've done the Guinello's criticism. Now we're doing the general objections. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, so for yeah. listeners, we've uh, we've taken a little break in between parts here, so that's that might be the... Um... And we've been left the microphones for two hours in between, so we've yeah. had time to re- regenerate our thinking powers and come back and put them to good use. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't we? <laughs> Don't look at me like that. You just thought it was part four a second ago. You can't go... Let's just go. Okay. Just go. <laughs> okay. Um, the ontological argument... Um, is a little anecdote. We did a um, once we did like a six form conference day, and I think it was one of your students, Andy, who came along. I, yeah. And yeah, you, yeah. the idea was you tweet jokes and stuff, and they all came up on a big screen, and someone just put the ontological <laughs> argument, the biggest joke of them all. No, wow. I don't even think they said that. I think it was just like, what's the biggest joke? It's just the ontological argument. Okay, there you go. I've made it worse. Wow, it that's, uh, <laughs> it's, that's pretty harsh. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a well, cold is it pretty, regard. There we go. Good. That's our inquiry question. Is it pretty harsh? Let's find out. So, um, we've got some major criticisms from all the big dogs in the world of philosophy ready for you. And, <laughs> what, and that, and that? the first big dog is going to be, can we do, can we Should start with the, no, can we Aquinas. do Aquinas first? Yeah, let's do Aquinas. That's somebody who, Aquinas who we didn't actually um, Thomas. talk about okay. last time. Um, should we just jump directly? My in? darling. Uh, Thomas. Your, do- the, your darling Thomas. Go on, Andy. Um, explain to right, us so Aquinas' criticism of the Outside of, because obviously so far on the podcast, we've actually only talked about uh, St. Thomas Aquinas in terms of ethics, but actually most people probably know Aquinas through his uh, philosophy of religion um, when it comes to the existence of God, and that's mm-hmm. what most people think of when they, when they think of Aquinas. Now, Aquinas had his own arguments, and we'll get to those in a later episode, but he did have a criticism of the ontological ar- argument, and essentially what he gets at is that this idea of God as something with, than which nothing greater can be conceived is not really knowable. Um, because God as an essence is something that human beings just can't entirely grasp um, at all. And therefore, like trying to give God, God these qualities, how on earth are you, how, how do you know that? Like, have we experienced God? Has anyone fully experienced God enough to be able to say this for certain? Mm-hmm. Um, so a, perhaps a simple way to put it is um, as followed. So a square, Ollie, what is a square? It's a shape with four sides. How do you how do you know that? Because I've seen some, and I've looked at it and gone, "What's that shape?" Okay, and then they've told me it's a square because it's got four sides. Mm-hmm. Right. So if we ask the same question, "What is a square?" to somebody who didn't speak any English at all, had no like concept of the language that we were using and the idea of what we just said, what 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 are they going to say? Uh, if they can't speak in English, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, well, but like what? Jack, what problem yeah. does that actually pose to this idea then? The problem of knowing that a square is a square only because you've seen squares. Yeah. Well, there's a... Sorry, if I deviate from this, let me just do my own thoughts. There's a big sure. argument whether knowledge of numbers and shapes are a priori, um, but to fully grasp the concept of a square, some people might say you can just understand that a squ- what a square is through reason alone, just by thinking... Are you, is this along the same lines you're thinking? Yeah. So what's the upshot of that for the ontological argument? Well, the, the whole point is, is that like, so you can only know what a square is when you, when you have learned about the concept of a square. Mm-hmm. And then obviously it makes sense and you have this knowledge of the shape and that will never leave you. But right. like, but you could like, you couldn't just get, you couldn't say like, oh, so what's the quality of a square to somebody who had never heard that word or had no experience of that before? It's just, yeah, it is just a, a big kind of, proposition of a priori arguments are 
struggle to work okay. and and therefore we could use the same thing for god like nobody has fully experienced god no one can know the, all of the qualities right. of god for okay. certain yeah, we are we are making huge assumptions mm -hmm. and therefore like the the first it basically attacks the very first premise like yeah it's a it's a good idea and it's what most people think of as god but can we actually know that interesting and, descartes has quite a nice um he draws some he uses an example about the mountain. Have you heard the mountain one? No, so I don't the, think that there's a big mountain, and that's that's God. And you can kind of you can see the mountain. You can pick up little rocks around the mountain and say, "Oh, this one's this rock, this one's that." But you can't get your arms around the mountain. You can't fully grasp what the mountain is. So to say that God's the greatest thing that can be conceived is trying to get your arms around too much of the mountain for Aquinas. Is that okay? Yeah, I think that that's that probably so. Would, fair. would we say that Aquinas has just a, a general problem with the definition of God being what it is? Uh, it, well, it's argument, interesting, isn't it? I think he doesn't. He almost yeah. He maybe has a problem with that. I mean, just so we're really clear. I mean, obviously. As as you would be aware, if you've listened to episode four and and you know about Aquinas, then you know that God, like he obviously thinks God does exist. And I think he perhaps has the same similar issue to what uh, Gornillo has is that he has no problem with the idea that God God's existence is real, but he would just go a completely different way about trying to prove that. And mm -hmm. um, just with the with the ethics, and uh, we we talked about like how he's he's an empiricist in a way in the sense that he he wants to find out about god's existence through what we can look at uh, the world and and then through uh inductive reasoning we can piece up together things to say finally god does exist which is a completely different way yeah. to how anton's going yeah about completely it. different and, and there i think that's where he just he just has a fundamental difference in thinking yeah he wants to prove that god exists a posteriori doesn't he and yeah uh, uh, anselm a priori so we're looking at cosmological and teleological in the next two episodes so they'll be brought to light in those two should we jump on to do you, do you want to take the reins on kant ollie is that someone you want i'll to... take the reins on the dog of kant yeah okay the reins on the dog yeah um okay so we've got um <laughs> sorry this is Richard Cannon riding a dog. <laughs> <laughs> riding a dog. Yeah. We should take the reins. Like. Yeah. yeah. That's like, no, it's a chariot being yeah, pulled yeah, yeah, by yeah. dogs. Um, okay. So Kant's main criticism of the ontological argument is that existence is not a predicate um, or property um, of, of God. Um, so obviously the argument, the way it's put forward is that obviously God is the most perfect being. Um, we know that obviously Kant did believe in some form of god he's got no problem with the you know the belief in god he has he just doesn't really like the ontological argument structure towards it um and the fact that um we can go back to the triangle example so uh, a triangle um exists um it necessarily has three sides um but it won't have to exist because existence is not a predicate in this way yep. so the definition of a triangle is it's a three-sided shape that does not mean that shape exists. I can imagine a triangle in my head that has three sides. That doesn't mean that particular triangle exists in any way. Um, it's not a predicate um, and therefore can't be used to prove the existence of something. Okay. Because you get into the problem that we looked at earlier with um, Ganillo, where you can kind of reason anything into existence. Just because you can think about it in your head doesn't mean it's it's real. Yeah, and just just think, when you're, when you're thinking about any object and you're discussing, let's say if you're discussing it and... Um, we, even if we take something that we wouldn't say necessarily exists, so with mermaids and right, so Ollie, for the sake of this argument, let's say that you think mermaids do exist. Oh, and Jack, oh, you I do, and Jack, you you don't agree with mm -hmm. that. So, like, how Jack, in your head, even though you don't think that mermaids exist, how are you going to describe a mermaid? Um, big flappy fish-like tail, um, beautiful lady top. Can you have a man mate? That's a man mate. A mermaid. A mermaid. Is yes. it specific? Yeah, to so it has to yeah, would say like the predicate okay, would have to be female yeah, as well. So it's uh it's got a human female top and a big fish bottom. <laughs> <laughs> that sexy sounds lovely. Fish <laughs> it sounds like a like a top ten chart hit. Like, <laughs> big, like, <laughs> um and right, and, and now Ollie, so you you do think that um that mermaids do exist. Oh, yes. So could you describe to me what a mermaid is? Um, <laughs> uh, it's something which is. Oh, wait, what? what, yeah. what are you no, just, yeah, just, yeah, something that's yeah, half just, fish. Yeah, yeah, so something that's got the tail of a fish, and normally, yeah, like a the upper half of a female human. Okay, right. And what do we what do we learn there? The we both share the same concept. Yes, of we what both mermaid understand so, what a yeah, mermaid is. And yeah. at no point was existence a predicate in your 
in your explanation of those things. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's so, true, yeah. Yeah, so no... you, you don't learn anything new. There's nothing to be gained by saying that existence is a predicate. That's mm-hmm. just almost a given. You can, you can think of something imagine, like completely by imagination and, and kind of come to the same conclusion. It doesn't therefore mean that like it has to exist, yeah. as you said. It, existence is always separate from the essence of something. It's not part of its intrinsic existence because that just wouldn't make any yeah. sense. Yeah. Good. Okay, so predicates, in a sense, describe things, don't they? Yeah. So this book, it's made up of 300 pages and the ink which makes up it, and those are things that describe what it is, the concept, in the same way as the, the big fish bottom and the female top is a mermaid. But existence isn't a predicate in no sense. So let's use God. God's omnipotent, God's omniscient, God's omnibenevolent or loving or powerful or knowing. Um, but he's But the existence element isn't a part of the description of his being. It's an extra thing. To exist is, you know, to have the concept of something. We use Hume. We bring in Hume here. Hume says, existence following Kant. Existence is a predicate, which so something can exist or not exist. So you can have this whole idea of God with all of the characteristics, all the predicates of its nature, but to say that it exists, it's contingent. You can say it exists or not exists. It doesn't exist. Its existence doesn't hold just because the rest of the characteristics do. Does that make yeah? Existence is existence is is separate. Yeah, it's separate from other description things about objects or beings. Yeah. So really, I mean, Hume and Kant there just completely tear apart this idea of necessity entirely. Like the God is not a necessity to Hume because, like, you can yeah, you can he can imagine a perfect being but why is that a necessity like mm-hmm. it does make a quite a decent argument there i would imagine what do we think of the argument itself do we think it's kant's and hume's what they've outlined there holds weight do we think it debunks anselm's whole argument is that the knockdown yeah i mean in the sense that like what i quite like about both is that they don't necessarily attack it on grounds of like looking at like like a posteriori stuff and saying like we can explore the world and see that god doesn't exist they actually just kind of take it apart in the same way that it was put together in a way yeah. they just they just they just mm. attack the underlying premises of it or without even having to say like just look at the world we know we we can tell god doesn't exist like a human obviously doesn't even feel like he has to do that mm-hmm. at all yeah i like i like the fact that this the their reasons and logical criticisms and i quite like the fact as well that the the entire this this kind of conversation this debate around the existence of god is completely separate from any kind of christian or or kind of jewish or any other religions kind of baggage i guess to it it's just literally the existence of this being what the being's like and stuff is kind of separate but they're literally just trying to deconstruct the existent the focus on the existence yeah and nothing else it's not you know it's, we, we could talk about whether we think god's all loving um or all powerful and we might touch on this a little in future episodes with the problem of evil but for this argument and the criticisms are quite direct in the terms of it's just the existence um obviously what's god what god is like is a different question as well the argument itself is just for existence, but I'm going to dis- disagree with you on a little, on a small point if that's okay. Do it, yes, a disagreement <laughs> on the pan psychos. Yeah, so we should it. have like a, a jingle for a disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> that that inception. <laughs> just put that in. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> and this is all coming from Anselm's theology of a perfect being. What what is God? Is the greatest being that can be conceived? So God's made up of all the great making qualities. So think of someone. Um, Ollie, think of someone that you admire. Who's someone you admire? Ooh. Um, someone I admire. Um, I really like Miles Davis, who was a jazz trumpeter. Jazz trumpeter. Why do you? What's his name again? Miles Have you Davis. Not heard of Miles Davis? No, I haven't. Oh, sorry. Is that bad? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, uh, Miles Davis is really cool. He he yeah, literally hold on, hold on. was very prolific. Let, let me he, let me do that again. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, what do you like about Miles Davis? Uh, Miles Davis was probably one of the most successful jazz musicians of all time. He yeah, had tell an, me what I don't know. Yeah, he had a really <laughs> <laughs> he had a really prolific kind of um, collection of work. He never made the same album twice. So mm-hmm. he made so many different kinds of music um, and was very um, kind of focused on the idea that it was all about kind of. Um, constantly changing and moving on to the next thing it wasn't about just recycling the same songs over again he'd do albums which were just like two songs two like two 20 minute songs or he'd do some albums that were spanish influenced 
He'd do some some cool jazz, some hot jazz. He, yeah, <laughs> loads of stuff. What? Zach, so much stuff. I, was looking, I was looking for something really. There's so many things there that make him. It's okay. So would you say that he was creative? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, what are the what are the single words would you use to describe? Um, how why creative, is talented, um, hardworking, talented, hardworking, it's like yeah. talented, hardworking, creative, and like perfectionist. I guess perfectionist. Okay, good. Yeah. Andy, someone you admire. Barack Obama. Barack Obama. Why do you admire Barack Obama? What what's admiral? What makes him great? Well, I think as far as politicians go, particularly in America, that like he he obviously stuck to some actual decent things. He he like every time there was a, a shooting, a mass shooting in America, he like he constantly came out and said like this is getting ridiculous. We need gun control. Mm-hmm. Even though like I guess he knew that he couldn't push that through. Like he was at least very adamant about his views and how important he felt those were. Now, obviously, I guess, as politicians go, he couldn't do everything that he wanted to, but he seems to be at least a reasonably trustworthy politician. So trustworthy, determined. Yeah. Yeah. Intelligent. Yeah, intelligent. intelligent and Good. Yeah. Okay, so creativity, determined. What were some of yours again? Hardworking. Hardworking. Okay, these are all great making qualities that we think are great about people right so all the great making qualities god has them but god doesn't just have great making qualities god has you know he's the greatest being that can be conceived he's got the greatest of the great making qualities he's he's omni determined he's omni creative and omni (laughs) hardworking he's 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 the ultimate of all these great making qualities so you can take any of those great making qualities and use it plug it into anselm's argument and that's an argument for god being hardworking or trustworthy or any of these things. God is the great, he's all of the great making qualities together, omni. What if other people didn't think those terms were great though? So if someone thought hard working was, like, they're like, actually, being hard working is all right, but I'd Good. much rather lay in around and be lazy. Is God all lazy? Good. Is right. he all, I don't know, judgmental? Okay. This is, this. so this is my, I was going to say this for part four, but we can jump into it now if that's okay, because it still can't. Mm-hmm. So do you remember what we said about Kant being a moral realist in the last episode? Oh, yes. Right, so take Kant. Everything, there's something objectively good about good th- about things. So it's better for one to do one thing than the other. So it's better for me to get out and do things than it is to stay in bed and be lazy. It's better to um, give change to a homeless person than it is to walk past and tell them to go to hell. There's <laughs> there's something better it is to catch the baby rather than let the baby fall to the floor. There's something objectively good about these these acts which are good in and of themselves. But if you just say, hold up a second, uh, freeze time, don't catch the baby just yet, let, let me throw something into the mixer, <laughs> um, you could say, um, these things are just social constructs in a very Nietzschean like, um, evolutionary way. The th- reason we think that catching the baby is good is because evolution teaches us that you know to help our species survive is a good thing and ethics is just a construct of humanity there's nothing objectively out there in the world good or bad about the acts they're just you know have you heard of ajs boo hurrah like we just say yeah. boo to bad things and yeah. hurrah to think emotivism you know, yeah. ethics is just a product of our emotion so your criticism of just then saying that um perhaps hardworking some people might think it's better to be not hardworking then yeah you could say you know these great making qualities are just relative social constructs and there's nothing objectively good about them and therefore to ascribe god them is just absurd yeah and then there's the the philosopher um uh, ludwig feuerbach as well who kind of talks about god being a projection of humanity um and the idea that what we want god to be is all loving all knowing because these are things that most of us kind of want we want knowledge and love and power and stuff like that but that's only because we're human if we were some other form of creature we would want god to be something different it's kind of like a projection of our own ideas of what we want i think moral moral realism is a a good good stance to to hold i think there's a big debate between whether you go for anti or anti-realism or moral realism but let's say moral realism holds for the sake of continuing this let's say there are objectively good and bad things it's better to do one thing than the other objectively just so we can move forward and not just chuck him out the window before we carry on. St. Anselm's often accused of committing the fallacy of begging the question, i.e. he's assuming the thing that he's trying to prove with his argument. What do we think of this? Well, he, by, like, we're linking it back to what we said about Aquinas, yeah, he most certainly is, isn't he? He's, he's assuming a lot of properties about a thing that 
like the, the, for everybody can't definitely know you you are that is an assumption how do we know that god is this you assume he is and that's that by definition you can't actually know either right so the most perfect thing you can imagine it's better than that i mean you can't you almost can't disagree or argue with that that definition can you you can try, I guess, but you, it's difficult to say it's beyond your understanding. Yeah. It's almost kind of like a... It's better to, for him to be beyond our understanding than within our understanding. Is that the, what you're going for? Yeah. 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 So we wouldn't be able to comprehend the nature of his... Again, with the mountain thing, we wouldn't even be able to pick up some of the rocks because it would be better for it to, the mountain to be you know, nowhere near us than within our grasp, yeah. the type of thing. But even though he's still coming from that revelation theology point of view he still wants to incorporate things from biblical texts into his framework of what god is so he's staying true to that just trying to say that he's the greatest thing as well obviously aquinas would disagree with certain aspects of that but it does hold some weight that it's parsimonious it's simpler to say that he's just the greatest being that can be conceived there's something good something positive there about his theory he's trying to salvage something from what will eventually be the wreckage by the end of this <laughs> criticism stage well, yeah, I, I mean, again, with so many of these things, like, yeah, if you accept that premise, then I think his, it's, it works nicely. And I quite like it in that way. But you, if, it's, if you can't, if you are assuming, if he is begging the question, then, then the whole thing just doesn't work, does it? In the medieval ages, people thought things could exist in the mind. So when we say exist in the mind, we mean something different to what Ansel meant. So to exist in the mind, these ideas actually were present in the mind now epistemologically in the study of philosophy of knowledge we can you know there's a big argument we can debunk that he act, that it actually exists in the mind so there's a problem there which we're not going into massive detail i want to look at the devil argument do we look at can we look at that one sure yeah the, let's go the for parody it. of the ontological argument by chambers his devil argument i have actually haven't got this written down so i'm just going to try and <laughs> wing it and say what i think it, it turns is. out to be completely wrong <laughs> <laughs> so if, if we have been accused of straw manning then at least i've been forward yeah. and said i'm about to straw man go on then John. straw man away okay so the devil is the worst thing that can be conceived the devil exists at least in our understanding but surely it's better it's worse to exist in the mind than it is to exist in reality. If there was something that existed in reality, then it would be better than the thing that exists in the mind. This would be a contradiction because the devil is the worst thing that can be conceived. And <laughs> see how I'm stripping because I haven't got this written down. But this is a contradiction. So the the devil must be the worst thing that can be conceived, and therefore the devil can't exist. He must exist only in the mind. Right? You're using the same logic. Um, for the ontological argument that you're using, you're kind of flipping it on its head. Flipping it on its head, yeah. <laughs> so if you take the worst being you can conceive, yeah, um, and it, or you know, it's even worse than that, um, and then you're kind of you can't prove that that using the same reasoning, you can't prove that that exists. Mm -hmm. It has to not exist because obviously that's an awful thought in your mind. Yeah. Therefore, it can't be real. It's worse to exist in the mind than it is to exist in reality. So if the devil is the worst thing to be conceived, it cannot exist in reality because it's the worst thing. It has to exist only in the mind, so the devil doesn't exist. Now, his argument there is twofold. It's one that the devil's imperative to uh, Judeo-Christian theology, Revelation theology. Also, it's flipping it on its head and saying that his deduct deductive reasoning doesn't work because look at the product if I flip it on its head and do this. But what's and so I'm going to say to this criticism, what's he going to say to the devil argument? Has he got a response? Do you think he's got anything in his locker? Is he going to respond to it? Or is he going to say, hands up, I, you I, got I, me? Well, no, I think Anselm's still going to think, the answer. he's probably going to say that that criticism from Chambers misses the point, I guess. Okay. But in terms of the reasoning, I don't really know how. <laughs> well, but... I think, I mean, because what he would just say is, is that, I mean, surely he could, he could just say, right, fine, the devil doesn't exist, but that doesn't mean that but God... he won't want to say that, will he? Because no. he he's going he's gonna to want to say that the devil does exist. Well, take, take uh, yeah, I, I know th right, I know that he... Yeah, is the devil the worst thing you can conceive of? Yeah. And someone might say no. What, does he have any great-making properties, qualities that we've discussed? Is he determined? Is he hard-working? What, the devil? Is he powerful? Yes. Is he knowledgeable? Yeah. But just not as powerful. Just not as powerful, knowledgeable. Yeah, he's not the most evil. Wait, no, not... No, yeah. 
okay, good. So he might have the great making qualities of being super strong, super powerful, the ability to pull people into doing bad things or the omniscience to know what's going on in the world. But he might not have, he's only bad in the sense that he's evil. He might have all the same great making qualities of God, but if he's evil, he loses that bit of the great making puzzle. He's got one bad thing about him. So he's not the worst being that can be conceived. He's just evil. He's just yeah. a bad being. Yeah. Probably one of the worst bad beings, at least in the top five. <laughs> the top five. <laughs> Detour. <laughs> Who are the five worst beings? Well, uh, politically, I'm not allowed to say. Yeah, um, so we'll put the devil in there. Yeah. Hitler's got to be in there. Mao's pretty bad. Yeah. Um, Kanye West. <laughs> Dude, that's harsh. <laughs> T-Pain. <laughs> Nah. T T Pain, Ice Cube, Little John. <laughs> there we go. Done. Wow, top, top six. <laughs> <laughs> so we have <laughs> some, <laughs> some rappers, Hitler and the devil. Okay. Right. Okay. But this falls into, right, the, the hierarchy, which, um, so he, Anselm would have been functioning, functioning or would have understood the world to be made up of this hierarchical way. So it'd have God at the top. It'd have angels. Then it would have the devil. Then it would have humans, then it would have animals, then it would have plants. Below plants, he's going to have things like rocks, tables, chairs, earphones, iPods, iPhones, relentless, wimpies. And then below them, you have ideas, right? Ideas um, that could be things, that have the potential to be things. So, like, I might have an idea of a chair with 35 legs. Now, that idea sits just below the existence of a chair with 35 legs because it's better to be a yeah. chair with 35 legs in reality. But below that are ideas that can't come into being, right? So um, square circles or blah, blah, rhubarb, blah, you know, gibberish, things that make no logical sense. Square circles, what else? We're married bachelors. Yeah. We have things that can't come into existence. So the devil, So the worst thing that can be conceived, he falls into that last thing there. So if you substitute devil for... Um, Imagine the worst thing could be conceived. It's better. To, it's worse to exist in the mind than in reality. And some will say, "Fine, yeah, he's the worst thing to be conceived." He falls into there with square circles, married bachelors, mm -hmm. that that realm of bad things there. Yeah, but and therefore doesn't actually exist. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yeah. No, that's yeah, no, I think that's yeah, good, yeah. good. Criticisms are good as well. So you think if you can kind of remember if they are, it's literally a reverse of the logic you're already studying. So you literally just take the logic of the ontological argument and flip it, mm -hmm. um, and then that's that's a good one to remember. What do you think of these in the God Delusion? So Andy's just about to go to sleep. So Andy's just about to go to sleep and he's on page 85 of the God Delusion. Um, well, Richard Dawkins. And there's parodies in there like a plane crashed, killing 143 passengers and crew. But one child survived with only third degree burns. Therefore, God exists. If things had been different, things would have been different. That would be bad. Therefore, God exists. The majority of the world's population are non-believers in Christianity. This is just what Satan intended. Therefore, God exists. Person X died as an atheist. He now realizes his mistake. Therefore, God exists. Blah, 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 blah. So you get the whole mockery of the ontological argument of people trying to mock Anselm and say you can't define things into existence and that it's just wordplay. One of your go-to criticisms, isn't it, Ollie? Should we say that for oh, part yes. four? Yes. Should we jump into part four? Yes. Let's I don't go. think we have anything else to say. <laughs> <laughs> We're hitting it into overdrive. <laughs> part four. <laughs> Done! <laughs> There we go. Is that enthusiastic? Yeah, that's enthusiastic. <laughs> you know. Part four, further discussion and analysis. Our key inquiry question for this section, what the ruddy hell is going on with the ontological argument? Our go-to question when we yeah, have yeah. a question. Here's a quote from Bertrand Russell's biography. I remember the precise moment one day in 1894 as I was walking along Trinity Lane when I saw in a flash, or thought I saw, that the ontological argument is valid. I had gone out to buy a tin of tobacco. On my way back, I suddenly threw it up into the air and exclaimed as I caught it, Great Scott! The ontological argument is sound! Ooh, that's a very... Uh patronizing it... quote from uh, Bertrand Russell there. Obviously, Bertrand Russell um, wrote the history of Western philosophy and was uh, very critical of religious beliefs. But in his early life, he accepted the ontological argument. This, that, that's yeah, true. Was that yeah, genuine? That, that, wasn't, that wasn't even that sarcastic. Genuine. Was that it was not? me uh, reading it. As well. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so a fan and then obviously not a fan as he kind of grew yeah. up a little bit. So later on, in um, so that was in 1894 in his, I assume, his diary. I think he's got a diary. Um, and then in 1946, 
He said, the real question is, is there anything we can think of which, by the mere facts that we can think of it, it's shown to exist outside of our thought? So this is after he's obviously rejected yeah. the ontological argument. The real question is, can we reason things into existence? Can we use a priori reasoning to know something about the outside world? That's what he took from the ontological argument in the end. So he didn't accept it. So now we're going to kind of focus on, obviously, our opinions and the criticisms and the analysis of, of the whole thing and what we think about it. Um, so, Andy, do you want to start us off with your thoughts towards the ontological argument? What, what weaknesses it has? What, what, your, what your thoughts are? I mean, I, I kind of feel like with I agree with most of the criticisms that we've actually covered. So I'm I'm of the opinion that like either we just can't know God at all enough to say that like I would always go down the route of kind of like could we actually experience God in the first place? And I just personally I don't feel like even if God was real, to say that God was definitely that than which uh, anything greater can be conceived. How how can we actually say that for certain? Maybe God is just some sort of like demiurge, a, a God that created the world but has no actual input into it. Actually, like the qualities, it, it's not all powerful. It's just a powerful being. Like I would be okay with that. Perhaps that I understanding of would God. You, but. Would not not um, throw the religious believer out with the bathwater if you just said he's just powerful. Yeah. Like the, <laughs> and you're okay with that? Well, like in terms of the argument. Well, in terms of the, yeah, well, yeah. In the like, I just don't, I don't see God as like that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Okay. So I guess I just have a problem with the the first premise yeah. and the predicate yeah. that in, the involving the existence as, as like a, a concept as being the greatest yes. thing that can be conceived. Yeah, I mean, I would completely agree, and I'd even build on it as well, and saying that that definition of God raises far more questions about God as well in terms of nothing greater than something greater than which you can conceive I feel like it's just it just seems just too simple and complicated at the same time so obviously Anselm's got this definition there is nothing I mean as a Christian there is nothing in the Old Testament and the New Testament that shows that God is something greater than we can conceive I don't think. Well, could you give an example of that? Yeah, Let's we, start should, with the... we should clarify that Ollie isn't, you know, you, you do hold a degree in theology. This isn't coming from, so often people will say, oh, the Bible says... Yeah, you, no, absolutely, you, yeah. So, so, yeah, no, I've no, I, I, I've got nothing against Christianity. I've got nothing against Christians. Um, my mum's one, so, yeah, like... I, <laughs> <laughs> if Shout that's, out that's to Ollie's mum. Yeah, <laughs> she's, uh, she's a, a does she listen to Catholic. The, does she listen to the podcast? Uh, but no. she's reviewed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all that matters. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, no, absolutely. I've got no problem with religious belief at all. But I, I don't think that the, the Christian idea of God, to say it's the, a being that is greater than anything you can imagine, I just don't think is true. Um, the God of the Old Testament is at times very juvenile and does some very questionable things. So, for example, you can use the story of the Ten Plagues in Exodus. So mm -hmm. he, you've got all the locusts and that sort of stuff, but he kills or gets... Or sometimes in some stories replaced with an angel of death to kill the firstborn child in the whole of Egypt, no matter... Unless you put some lamb's blood over your door, that seems a bit harsh, in my opinion. Not exactly the behavior of a, what I would imagine a perfect being. Not even a imperfect being, I think, would make some kind of decision like that. So you could say it's better not to have the firstborn killed of each family. A being would make a decision to say yeah. that uh, it's better to not swarm a city with locusts than it is. Yeah. Right, so the only person that is stopping the Hebrews from being freed in that situation is the Pharaoh. Just kill the Pharaoh. Or, like, as I was saying before we were recording, just don't allow your chosen people to be enslaved in the first place. Yeah. Could you not just, like, so, like, the Abrahamic covenant of promising, like, an agreement with this people and then allowing them to go through so much suffering and pain and then to be so angry with them for not understanding the things. Um, one defense to that, though, I think you could, could you not use the, like, the book of Job and actually kind of, come to the conclusion that like what you've just described there is you not thinking that that's what a perfect being would represent that like and this is almost flipping aquinas's argument on its head and say like we just cannot understand the will of god that like like you have to just accept that suffering is a part of of existence and maybe even look at something like like irenaeus's theodicy and say like you just have to go through suffering. That is actually an ultimate good, and therefore it doesn't matter. I think. I think yes, to a certain extent. But I think if it's the suffering is caused by human beings, then that's that's absolutely fine because human beings, you know, make mistakes and are you know have the have the 
pros and their cons. But I think if you are a perfect being, even if you don't, even if we have no conception of what that perfect being is, I, I still, I, I still can't get my head around the idea of a perfect being killing innocent people. That doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, but that if to go back to what we said about the ethics thing, you're just saying boo God. That doesn't like ultimately that's just your emotional response to something that you can't understand. No, I would say that I think most people would say the killing of innocent beings, whether they're human or not, is not the act of perfection. Surely it's the act mm. of, of evil or the act of something that's imperfect, right? Only if we go from like human understanding of morality. Like if if maybe God has an ultimate plan that we cannot understand, Ollie, and that but that, no but matter they, how much suffering that you feel is acceptable. We can't get our arms like, around the mountain. We can't, understand. yeah, exactly. But so, Anselm's argument doesn't have that. All he's trying to prove is that God exists, doesn't it? I know. I'm not, not just, that God is moral. All I'm doing is I'm, I'm kind of... Well, I'm, he'd still I'm, say that he's moral. But this is interesting. But I'm giving yeah. the theist's response to perhaps some of the problems we're, we're offering here. So like we're mm-hmm. saying... Like, God can't be perfect because look at all of these examples in the Bible where God isn't perfect, yep. but actually God can be perfect and allow these things to happen. Um, perhaps it's more difficult when, when you're looking at the Bible and it, and particularly when God, um, is interacting directly on like himself. That's where it might get a bit more complicated where it, where it's like, well, yeah, and self contradictory, right? So surely if God is giving laws to humankind to follow, would it be unreasonable to ask that he follow the same laws? What, uh, what, say like... So like the, the Ten Commandments, for example? So yeah, if he's right, giving so these laws to humankind saying these are the absolute rules you need to follow to be good, God-worthy people, surely that'd be a bit weird if he himself did not follow those rules, wouldn't it? Okay, so uh, just to unpack, because there's a lot of different things there. But first of all, the main thing was that God isn't the greatest thing that we can see because he does some questionable things yeah. in the Bible which we don't consider great making qualities in the same way yeah. as we think T-Pain's a fantastic <laughs> musician. <laughs> right. So God perhaps does some things um, which which aren't considered great things um, by us. You're, Andy, you're responding by saying that perhaps we just don't know God's will or yeah. the nature of God in its entirety to say they're not great things. It might surpass our understanding to know that God had a great plan in mind so when i take little timmy to the doctors and say take this injection timmy it'll make you feel good and he's like ah you're not the greatest being that can be conceived like you just don't understand timmy and timmy's yeah. like a five-year-old cockney <laughs> 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 give me my son back <laughs> Sorry. go on timmy off you go so um yeah so exactly that that's a, that, that's a good to and fro there i mean yeah well i mean obviously i mean I think with the existence of God, it's is difficult, isn't it? Because obviously, uh, an argument like you will never understand God's will is, is mm. you know, almost you can't answer it to a certain extent. Um, but you can hold God to account for his actions. And if he does do certain, th- if he tells you not to do things and then does those things, that raises questions of of, of why. So you could, be, you could say he's a hypocrite, but Andy could say... He still well, exists. <laughs> well, he could say, well, you don't know. His hypocrisy might be a part of his great... Like, you don't know the full nature of God's plan, will. But but then nature, what's the difference in, between there being a plan and there being no plan? You don't... There is no difference. What? It's the same thing with the, the parable of the gardener. What's right. the difference between an invisible gardener? Oh, sorry, yeah. So the parable of the gardener, which is the idea that... So let's say you've got two people that walk into a forest um, and they walk into, like, this clearing um, and say that... One of them's a theist, one of them's an atheist. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, a- the, um, the atheist walks in and goes, Oh, this is a fairly nice clearing in a forest. And um, the theist walks in and goes, No, this is, this is, this is magical. This has been created by God just like this, this way. Um, and the atheist goes, All right, then prove it. Can you prove that this clearing has been made by God? Yeah. Um, so they wait around a little bit. Yeah. So they wait around a little bit. So, sorry. Sorry. So yeah. So sorry. The theist goes. It must. There must be a gardener that comes in and kind of makes it the way. It's so perfect and so beautiful. It must be, have some kind of gardener behind mm-hmm. it. Um, so the atheist goes. Okay. Well, we'll wait and see if the gardener shows up. So they wait a long time. Gardener doesn't show up. They go. Okay. Well, maybe. Yeah, right. He's fired. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's just left. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then they were like, okay, let's maybe let's make it. Let's let's let some traps to see if we can catch this gardener. So nothing too lethal. Probably just maybe some. Uh, some little fence maybe so maybe with the gate see if they can hear the gate open or close 
Um, still, there's still the techno gardener. Uh, okay, fine. Let's get some bloodhounds. See if we can smell him. So maybe that escalated quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> uh, well. The idea, maybe, maybe the god, maybe how to so get on with maybe the gate. The, well, maybe the got some bloodhounds around. Yeah, here yeah. You need them. I got some just uh, around the back. <laughs> yeah. So let's say maybe this gardener's intangible. You can't actually. Maybe he can just walk through the fence. Yeah. Or just you know go through the fence. Okay, let's get some let's get some bloodhounds so we can smell him. So, and then you know. They still wait, and the, the bloodhounds don't smell anything. They're just kind of sat asleep in the corner. They're like, oh, okay, well, maybe maybe this gardener is unsmellable and intangible. Um, and the kind of the point is that he could be anything. The point is that what's the difference between there being a gardener and no gardener at all? Just being... reference the person that said that, June, because Wis- it's quite a big point. John, no, I can't remember. Wis- wisdom? John Wisdom? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just say John Knowledge <laughs> John Philosopher if you don't John know. Wisdom yes it's John yeah, Wisdom so John Wisdom's Parable of the Gardener yeah um, and yeah exactly so going back to the original question mm-hmm. um, if someone's asking well you can't understand God's plan right. because it's beyond your understanding then well what's the difference between there being a plan and there not being a plan right okay what's the difference between there being a plan and not being a plan because if you can't understand it, you might there might as well be no plan. Uh, okay, yeah, which is which is a fairly good response. But annoyingly, for the person who wants to <laughs> argue against you, <laughs> you can say, you know, you don't. It, if if you could grasp the plan, then there would be a plan. Do you know the limits of your language and your your minds and your finiteness does not um, rule out the existence of something which go which pre- exceeds that or goes beyond that. Just because you can't, just because Timmy doesn't know the big plan, it's, it's still there, just for a being which can fully understand it in its own mind. Yeah, because you could just say, like, you could you could talk to any, like, young child and try and explain to them some... The ontological yeah, argument. Some, like, <laughs> yeah, some really complicated <laughs> problem, and, like, just because they can't understand it doesn't mean that it isn't actually real, right? So... Mm-hmm. I, I think if you're using up the, all of your sensory information... I mean, we're going back to the whole idea of skiing. You're going back to your a priori and a posteriori, right? So you can actually gather evidence and make a justified conclusion with the knowledge you have. Mm-hmm. But Anselm doesn't do that. He just says that you need to use, you can just use the a priori knowledge. Um, I personally lean more towards kind of what some Thomas Aquinas would think, where he's actually using the universe around him to prove, um, just like Batman and Robin, when they caught the Joker <laughs> earlier, yeah, they were using the, the inductive reasoning around them, yeah. um, as opposed to just kind of, um, the, the deductive, very almost wordplay. Um, yeah, used you to can kind argue that it's, it's pure. It's pure. There's a there's a combat there. It says the a priori is the only known. You know, you could be a skeptic and say the world Kant himself. At last episode, here we go, linking old episodes, saying that the only thing we really objectively know is the category of the mind, you know, and space and time too. But these things out there in the world, we only can perceive their dispositions what they do we can't know their essences their ultimate truths so you could say perhaps pure reason is the only way to attain categorical imperatives truths about the world or maybe a combination of the two maybe as well you can argue a combination yeah so not well, just one or the other so you can use both well we well, said that I mean, this is episode kind of counts, two. we said this in episode three yeah. really really early on yeah we said if you would be a priori a posteriori which would it be which is kind of stupid we've asked some stupid <laughs> questions that's probably Man, we're dumb. <laughs> <laughs> but um you yeah you you can't ignore either but i think the a priori does hold great weight but i don't think that's the issue with this argument and in and of itself um i think the issue is what we were looking at earlier with kant and hume and um what do you think about the ontological argument jack uh, I think that Norman Malcolm sums it up really well in that following Kant and Hume that the doctrine at that existence is perfection in Dawkins words is remarkably queer it makes sense and is true to say that my future house will be a better one if it is insulated than it is not insulated but what could it mean to say that it will be a better house that exists than it does not exist it's absurd to put existence in the same boat as boats and not <laughs> that was good. I like that. Right? It's, it's ridiculous to say it's better to have a sail than not a sail. It's better to have a shiny Charizard than a non shiny Charizard to be level 20 or level 5. Like, it's absurd to say existence goes in the same bucket with those things. And Hume kind of nails it on the head when he says existence is contingent on that. It, you know, if you have a concept of something, existence and non existence is something which goes here or there. It's not something encapsulated by the term itself. 
I'm, yeah, I'm happy with that. Should we do what? Can we do a little uh, argument? So we're doing this whole point is argument based on reason alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the part of the A level anyway. So in um, Kaelman's Are Children Intuitive Atheists? It's like a paper. I'll link it in the, on the website. It's a review of lots of it's exper- it's research out in the field. It's philosophy a priori. This, this might confuse people. A priori is just based on reason, isn't it? But it's a priori out there in the world because they go and ask people what they think is a priori. So they go to schools, pe- people all around the world, children with atheist backgrounds, people who don't speak any English apart from the yes, no, thumbs up they've taught them. People who, everybody, they've asked everybody. Yeah, they definitely asked everybody. <laughs> they asked me the other day. Yeah, I think they'll, they'll get to me soon. <laughs> yeah, they, they knocked on my door. Asking everybody. The box. I, don't, I haven't asked that many people. They've but asked, asked you. Children. From from right. every continent, I think, but they've asked a lot of people, right? Okay. So they put a box in front of you. So I'm gonna. Here's that box. Oh, that's a good looking box. Oh, wow, that's a that's a fancy box. Oh, thank you. I picked it from home base <laughs> the other day. Had some great offers on in there. Man, you got some good rakes in there. <laughs> Could buy a rake, get a box. Just, just no, just yeah. no. no, get all of the no wim- wimpy burgers. If we can't talk, if we, kill, if we can't talk about Trump. We can't talk about home base. Okay. Surely. So the, uh, we already right. here's the box. So what's there. in this fantastically value, good value for money box you've got in front of you from home base? What's so what's in it, there? just so obviously you can't see the box. So explain to us what the box looks like, Jack. Okay, it's uh, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight corn, eight corners. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six sides. Is there a hole on the top or can we not see inside? Can we see inside it? Or? Well, okay, it's just a box, right? It's a box with a lid on. You can't see what's in the okay. box. Cool. Right? It's yeah. a box. Yeah, I didn't need like, like all the literally, corners. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just, more, for for our listeners, the they, they, they can't see the box. Actually, Jack, could okay. you just go into a little bit more detail about that box? <laughs> <laughs> the card was made in 19... 19- <laughs> Okay, right. The, the wood box, first originated from an oak tree in <laughs> Australia. <laughs> right. I never thought a box could be so interesting. Right, the box is in front of you. Do you know what's in the box? No. How would I know? I haven't looked in the box. Okay, well, you're not going to look in the box now. Okay. Would God know what's in the box? Probably. Yeah. Yeah, God, God has to know what's in the box because God knows everything. So the title of the article is Are Children Intuitive Theists? So the argument there, the upshot of it, and they don't do this in the conclusion of of this piece, but you can probably assume what is going to be the upshot of it, is that children are born with some kind of innate a priori knowledge of the nature of God. Now you're probably thinking of criticisms right now, thinking I've spent the last 10 years in assembly singing all things bright and beautiful, God's got the whole world in his hands, come by my lord, come by our. So I have this concept of God that he's you know, the origin of all these great hymns and prayers and this world, and he must know everything because I've been taught it. But the argument from here is these people don't have a great knowledge of God or they aren't biased towards um, religion or theism. That intuitively, it looks in there, they look at teleological explanations for the world. So when they're asked, what's that rock for? They say, like, this rock's for... Like throwing at strangers. What's this rock for? That's not an example from it. What's this lion for? They say the lion's for the zoo. They look at teleological explanations. Now you can see how they've crafted this because you want to say, chill, but the question, what's that for? You're immediately assuming that it has a purpose or yeah. aim. But the, the part, of, the interesting part is that they think that God's omniscient. Um, and obviously that's an argument there to say that children know that God's omniscient a priori how does that link to our discussion on Anselm? so they you could say could how about i bring in a big boulder into the room and i say guys can you lift that and you say no it's ridiculous and it's massive um and then i say can god lift that sure yeah. he's all yeah, powerful okay. there we go <laughs> <laughs> said with such enthusiasm <laughs> yes yes he can lift the boulder Right, and this is revolutionary here because I don't think this has been mentioned before. The upshot of this article has been used in this way, mm-hmm. unique to this podcast, uh, Pan Psychas exclusive. Do Charizards exist? No, not in real life. Yeah, only as a concept of uh, imagination. Does God exist in real life or only in imagination? No, I would argue like only in the imagination. I would do the same. Okay, so you see the jump there between asking something about a predicate of God, his omniscience, his omnipotence, and asking whether God exists. You're making a massive metaphysical claim that goes beyond the concept um, of its nature. 
So you can see the big jump there. I don't think children are intuitively theist in that sense. I think if you went out into the world and did that experiment, you'd get very different results in comparison to all these other great making properties, ex excluding existence. Would you think we'd find the same if we asked a load of people? We should have a montage now of asking, dragging people into the room. <laughs> so what, yeah. if we just ask the question, like, does Charizard exist? No, yeah, of course, God exists. <laughs> you probably find why that, wouldn't he? That it's taught though, rather than than um, it's yeah. Acquired. yeah so so like, something yeah, might be something innate that people mm -hmm. know. Is that what you're trying to get across? Yeah. Some people might just instinctively think that there is some form of higher being that mm. has some form of well, because they they've done those experiments would... on on um, chimpanzees, as well, didn't they? Found that chimpanzees had some form of religious practice that they did. Like these really, they noticed that these patterns yeah. in zoos where they had these really bizarre rituals they would do before they did certain yeah, kind of like big social hat activities. And runs around the Vatican. All well, time. yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Just someone wearing the hat. Sorry. <laughs> so we can't be political, but we can liken the Pope <laughs> to a monkey. Yeah. Okay. Um, Let's yeah, just... yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but they. That's okay. Can we yeah. keep that bit in? Yeah. Is that yeah. Okay? yeah. But they, but they noticed as well that, um, like before they used, before sometimes when they had like eat together as a meal, they would do like a form of like prayer almost. Or like these kind of odd dances that were oh, kind okay. of there was literally no reason why they would do this other than maybe a form of some kind of <laughs> Sorry, wait, there's no reason why they might not do it but God exists <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah no I'm, I'm not not that God exists but there there might be some kind of like superstitious maybe belief yeah I'm I'm th no that's the bit of like, I completely accept the idea that like it's completely natural for for a being to kind of look for an answer and want there to be a higher being that's fine that just just doesn't necess like necessitate the idea of existence so mm. it's whether we can know it a priori yeah um do you think we can can we know it a priori that god exists no in in the same way in the linking back to the aristotle plato episodes when we talked about um like the knowing of the forms or anything like that or just reacquiring knowledge and it's like well was the was the slave boy actually like acquiring knowledge about geometry through questioning alone well Possibly not. Maybe he, he picked up enough information to kind of piece things together. And maybe, like, even if you you hadn't heard much about God, but you just, somebody had mentioned a concept similar to that, you might be able to kind of come to a conclusion. I just don't think that with any knowledge, like, if, if you just ask anybody who'd never learned anything and just said, like, you know, what what is a square? Like, how how are they supposed to access that? I'm going to what I think they'd know what a square is. A you, priori. You think you could, you could. It's controversial because so many different people, when it comes to maths and shapes and stuff, there's a great amount of philosophers that say you know them a priori. But with things like cogito ergo sum, mm -hmm. um, that's what other a prioris can we think of? Two plus two equals four. I think you know two plus two equals four a priori. You don't have to go mm -hmm. out into the world. See, no, I'm, I'm of the opposite opinion. I think that, like, you, you gain those concepts. <laughs> No, carry on. Yeah, no, 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 I'm just burying my head in because it's a can of worms. But we can, yeah, we can open, should we open a, open it a little bit? We'll have a little peek inside. Yeah, yeah sure. Can. So all I'm all I'm arguing is that like the like, the num like even just numbers as basic ideas like you can only get a concept of what is one or two by like by either being told that or or the like or seeing that like right. So I've got one rock and two rocks, and now I know that one's like two is more than one. And then that becomes a concept that you don't you don't then need to count the rocks another time to do like your, your your actual equations. You can just do it in your head. But I think you you need to gain that knowledge first in some simplistic way, and then you can work, and then you can kind of know that you can go up to infinity or whatever. But so whether you can do it a priori or a posterior, or whatever. so you can say I'm, I'm just going to say there needs you, yeah. You just like I I'm I think I'm happy to be corrected on this but i just think that I, I we have to acquire at least some knowledge before we can then build build off that um, okay and then that allows our imaginations to kind of run wild but before that you need to do can we pose that as a question to our listeners if anyone disagrees with andy feel free to get in touch tweet at the panpsychist and let him know your thoughts on his uh on his thoughts it's interesting as well when we're talking about concepts we can't understand as well. So even the idea of infinity is quite an interesting concept, right? So all of us probably accept that infinity is a thing that exists. Mm -hmm. You know, we know that if you go from, if you start counting one, two, three, four, you will never stop counting if you, you can't. Yeah. Infinity exists. Um, but you can't really comprehend infinity. Yeah. Like I can't comprehend the idea that numbers will go on forever. Um, or even, you know, 
so again you could maybe link that as well to the idea of god in terms of like our understanding of it you could say that if you can't understand something infinity but you still think infinity is true um just because you don't understand you know the idea of a perfect being means that you know it could still yeah. be true mm-hmm. in some Which way what we said earlier about the garden didn't we yeah. yeah if god's the greatest being that can be conceived um then it's better to be infinite than finite so god's going to be infinite according to anselm too isn't it? that links in quite nicely yeah just your thoughts on this last quote. It's quite a lengthy quote, so okay. keep keep on the ball. From Bertrand Russell, A History of Western Philosophy. We like Bertrand Russell, and he's, he sums up things quite nicely. He was a very passionate smoker. <laughs> Just chucking his tobacco everywhere yeah. every time he had an insightful thought. <laughs> Ever since Plato, most philosophers have considered part of their business to produce proofs for immortality and the existence of God. They have found fault with the proofs of their predecessors. St. Thomas Aquinas rejected St. Anselm's proofs and Kant rejected Descartes, but they have supplied new ones of their own. In order to make their proofs seem valid, they have had to falsify logic to make mathematics mystical and to pretend that deep-seated prejudices were heaven-sent intuitions. What are your thoughts on that? That last sentence is quite good. Yeah, I thought Pretending their deep-seated prejudices were heaven-sent intuitions. And the, the the way you read that as well was um, like just coherent. <laughs> <laughs> I really I got that. I really did. I'm gonna edit out all the stumbles. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know what I'm aware of. Yeah. Um, Wait, yeah, you want to you want to say this on? Uh, well, it kind of sums up kind of what we've been talking about with the criticism so far. I guess. You just want to say yeah, just I yeah. agree. I mean, I I mean, I, to be honest, I think you know the, the question asking you know does God exist is covering one of the most fundamental philosophical questions um, and a question that humanity has been asking since surely the beginning of day dot day dot <laughs> day dot with the first man being like i wonder if there's more than just this cave and that rock um uh, god was like don't eat the apple <laughs> yeah. um yeah like, there it is <laughs> i mean personally for me i think that following the ontological argument i'm actually willing to a certain extent to be like okay you know what argument's not too bad god exists but I think that the actual definition of, a, of something that you cannot, that you can't conceive as being so perfect, I think I, I struggle with personally. I'm sure, and Bertrand Russell definitely does as well. And, and, and like, uh, just what going with that particular thing? Yeah, I kind of can kind of see that. Uh, with the particularly the last bit of this, pretend that that deep seated prejudice were heaven sent intuitions, like that. Yeah. You know, people are trying to to prove the existence of God, but with so much baggage that they're already bringing to the table that, mm. like, yeah, you, it's that kind of, if you want, just because you want to prove something exists, doesn't. What's that baggage it. for Anselm? Well, that he's grown up in, in an environment which is hugely religious. Like, he, he already knows that he wants to prove God's existence. And that, like, so he's, he formulates a way in which he proves his own prejudice, I guess. But, in, but if you look at this, so sorry, to, could, sorry to yeah. pry you, yeah, but yeah. To, just for clarification, if you took his argument in its form, ignore that it was Anselm, say yeah. it was Ollie's, and he said, "Here's seven steps to God's right. existence." Where, where do you, in terms of the argument, what do you think's the? But they, it's the, what, but the thing I keep going back to is the first premise that I the 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 assumption of God is something that, and this is when when I was talking about the a posteriori knowledge is why I kind of figure is what, where most of our knowledge comes from that Anselm has actually learned that at some point in his life that that's what he thinks is the the most of obvious description of God and I think I, th- I have no doubt that everybody at the time of Anselm would have also agreed with that conclusion but that doesn't mean that that wasn't like an idea passed down through the generations that he's now kind of just a deep-seated idea of what God is so that, that's kind of where he's going from and he's going to prove that that's right doesn't necessarily make it true i'm going to go for the existing in the mind one that it's better to exist in reality than the mind um, i think that links quite nicely into the idea of moral realism uh, you could subscribe to anti-realism and say that it's just as good to exist in the mind as in reality i know that's quite controversial but if you take the upshot of saying that there's nothing better objectively about throwing books or catching books or writing books, they're all just actions, and the thing is objectively good about them, or better or worse about them, then you you can say the same for mind and things in reality. Um, and existence isn't a predicate. I think it falls doesn't fall into the same basket as everything else, which we want to say about God. I don't think you can put it into the same group of, of descriptions. Yeah, you can't 
kind of you, you you can empirically verify existence almost to a certain extent, can't you? You know, if you we haven't really talked about the scientific method with this discussion, but the idea that obviously with our you know if you if you wanted to a posteriori kind of prove the existence of God, you can't. And surely, I don't think this ontological argument really pers- persuades many people who don't believe in God to believe in God. I don't think many people would look at this argument and go, oh, ooh, okay, fair enough, yep, yeah, must exist now. I'm going to become a hard-working Christian. Yeah, um, it, it, sorry, it, I was just going to say, it's really interesting yeah. you say that, because like, when you when you teach it to students as well, and I, I, I did it with um, Year 13s last year, and it's like they can grasp, they grasp the ad- argument understand the logic but yeah you're quite right they they don't they they don't suddenly just say right i now definitely believe like you can accept the argument and still reject the and still reject god you when you read well that's the thing is you'd be wrong to do so if you accept the premises well, you'd be have to accept the conclusion that's a deductive argument i know that well yes and no like you'd be a well, prejudice we, we, if you accept we all the con- this premises a hundred times i don't i don't need to repeat my <laughs> you don't need to, re- don't need to repeat myself <laughs> to you if Just you listen accept all the, the premises the podcast. you need to <laughs> yeah. that's that, i think that's what's going back to it we all think the ontological argument you think it's silly it doesn't work you're trying to describe god into existence when you've got the seven steps laid out in front of you he puts the ball in your court and says okay so where have i gone wrong you can sit there in front of him as the fool and say you know you're trying to do this trying to do that he can say well okay f- Forget all of that. Here's the steps, and where do you say you've gone wrong? And we've all just picked yours is premise one, Andy, isn't it? That God's greater than nothing to be conceived. I'd say that he, he ex- exists in our understanding, or that it's greater to exist in reality than the mind is mine. And Ali, what would you say yours was? He's what just premise? defining God into existence, so pretty premise one as well. So, the so idea, one as well, yeah. Yeah, pretty one as well. I don't really think, and I, to be honest, I don't think if you ask many people what is God, they would say the most perfect being that I can imagine. They would yeah. probably use a lot of other words before they used or came to that conclusion. If you ask them, do you think God is the most perfect thing beyond your understanding? A lot of them would probably say yes, but that's not thats not the most important thing about God for them. Philosophical ultimatum! Holy, well, I can't <laughs> Holy philosophical <laughs> yeah. ultimatum, <The> Batman. Batman. <laughs> <laughs> Ontology <laughs> doesn't affect these streets. <laughs> <laughs> it is these streets. <laughs> <laughs> these streets are purely cosmological. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that doesn't mean anything. Um, <laughs> okay. Shut up, Batman. You, talk <laughs> shit, yeah. you know, you didn't listen in RS, did you? <laughs> you I was just a rich, <laughs> privileged white boy. <laughs> My parents died. All right. Um, <laughs> should we uh... <laughs> go, 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 right. go? Give us a question. Everybody's favourite part of the show, you guessed it, philosophical ultimatum. <laughs> and uh, how many people are going to vote for an Ollie win this week? I know I'm not. Yeah, I mean, is, is, I mean, am I 3-0 and at this point? Yeah, where where are my man. mugs? Four, four yeah. or five, four. I think it's five. <laughs> Do I get some kind of loser's prize if I lose all of them? If he doesn't get a winner's prize, I think it's better to have a prize in the mind. Yeah, so where's right? I Losing need, the most that you can possibly imagine. I want a Pansai cast plate mug. T shirt. I want a t shirt. No. The fans are calling out for the t shirts, Jack. Well, they should subscribe first. Yeah, what, Dominique that? Hargreaves, I think it was. Yeah. Was she that? Was yeah, so he's. What a, like. A top five star we review. We, I know we should refrain from naming them unless they direct Oh, good can point. Can we name yeah. reviewers? Yeah. We named Alex Jordan in that. Yeah, one. we did actually. Yeah, 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 yeah you go. Yeah. So we sure we're free to use names. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not from. Yeah. Well, thank okay. you, Dominic. Yeah, thank that you, Dominic. That was uh, that was nice of you. Right. Anyway, let's go. I want to win this time. Philosophical ultimatum. Right. Ollie wants to win. He actually has his questions. You have the questions in front of you. Ollie's already had a sneak look at the I, questions. Yeah, I'll he? let him have that. You have can... you seen the questions uh, no, already? No, okay. no, I'm not that crafty. So, so I'm I'm honest and truthful. Okay. Mm. The categorical imperative instructs you to do so. Right. <laughs> Should we do jingles again? Yeah, why not? Right. Andy's jingle goes like this. Wow, that's awesome. And Ollie's goes like this. <laughs> Brilliant. Would you use yeah, your voices instead yeah, no, of influencing? No, I was, that was my no, response that, to no, the sound. No, that's your jingle now. That's, that's the your jingle. Sa- oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, okay. that's the jingle. That's, okay. Oh, right. Um, I so, thought I was... No, that's, they're the jingles. Okay. okay. Right. They're well, really whatever. We'll use them from now Thanks on as well. Thanks uh, for doing that. Question number one. Lights dimmed. Focused. Should existence be treated as a predicate? Wow, that's awesome. Andy, you buzzed in. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would, no, because it doesn't teach us anything new about any sort of property. We would just assume that existence is 
is there or not. So I would, I'm, I'm going down the route of Kant there. Oh, uh, yeah. Say, I would also say no, existence is not part of the central essence of an object. A triangle can have three sides, um, does have three sides in your mind or in reality, but existence, I can, I can imagine a triangle that has three sides. That doesn't mean it's real. Okay, I'm going to give Ollie the point there, okay? Not because he's got a fantastic answer, but because Andy started his answer with, yeah, uh, no, uh, I don't think you should do that. Yeah, you are. it's not very I philosophical. Said, I said inconsistencies. You should have learned by now. Yeah. Right, is the ontological argument, uh, does the ontological argument use belief? Buzz. Yes. At its core, do you think so? It uses yeah. belief? Yeah, absolutely. So you, buzz, it... you buzzed in there, Andy? Is that a buzz? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm going to say it is. And he's buzzed in. <laughs> yeah, it is because uh, going back to what we were talking about, the this like assumption, I think Anselm, and I don't even necessarily think Anselm would ne- agree with, uh, disagree with the idea that it is belief. He's he's coming from a position of belief, and he's saying that like you have to believe that God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, yeah, he's using theology, isn't he? So theology is based on the the idea that God already exists, and he's. He's already started. He's, he's not. We've we've had this discussion before, where we think that a philosopher should be very critical of all views and everything. Um, and he's not really. He just wants to prove God exists, and he's going to think of as many ways as possible until he finds uh, an argument that he thinks is sufficient enough to okay need God to exist. Um, I'm going to give Andy the point. Is that okay? No, I'm going to give you no feedback either. That's hor- <laughs> that's horrible. <laughs> Third, <laughs> that's horrible. <laughs> it's better. It's better to be horrible than not to be horrible. Are there logical fallacies in this argument that we cannot overcome? Wow, that's awesome. I'm just yes. going to push the Ooh, boundaries. Buzz. Of... Ooh, buzz, 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 buzz. Yes. I'm going to go for Ollie buzzed in first there. Yes. Ollie. Absolutely. So we've talked about these before. So obviously you've got the idea, the definition of God, which mm-hmm. you can kind of pick apart. Begging the question. Begging yeah. the question. Um, you've got the idea of reasoning things into existence. Mm-hmm. Obviously, p- p- picking apart that. Um, also the idea of things being... Uh, being you, you mentioned before your criticism of the idea of something being better in reality than in your mind. Not necessarily. Maybe you could uh, critique that. Um, you can't critique the deductive process, but in terms of its predicates, I think you can. Boom. Okay, interesting. I'm going to take a, a bit of a different approach here. I'm going to see if. Uh, just, sorry, just to interrupt. This is the deciding point. This answer will be. No, this. that's fine. I've got. Uh, yeah, yeah, you ready? I've got this. Okay. So I'm going <laughs> to. Yeah. Right, I'm, you're looking very calm. Are yeah. You? Right, yeah. Yeah. So, right, no, I'm just. I'm just testing. The, you marked like, some presentation as well as answer. No, I'm okay. That's fine. But I just have this theory. So, um, right. So I believe in predestination here, and that I'm going to win every single philosophical ultimatum. So uh, I'm just going to say, I don't know, toaster oven. That's my answer. Thank you, Jack. Okay, I'm just going to consult some third-party judges. They're measuring you on style, speed. <laughs> so, what, what do they do in Robot Wars? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they measure you Sergeant on... Sergeant Bash. Um, the results are in, and I can confirm the winner of Philosophical Ultimatum Episode 7 is... Andrew Horton. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jack. So I will accept my sixth mug, and um, it's been emotional. I think well deserved. This this game is commiserations to game Ollie once again. <laughs> <laughs> this game Maybe is next, You know what? Next episode, I'm going to lead philosophical <laughs> ultimatum, and then we'll see who wins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll ask the questions. We'll get Jack in the hot seat, and then maybe see if should we, we try. Should we do that? Next yeah, year? next yeah, episode, yeah, I'll do philosophical, that, so. and then maybe we can okay. swap it. I so just then. thought this was the way it was. No, I kind of like the idea that it's just like a running joke. Yeah, I just it's right. If you're winning that <laughs> joke, if you're the yeah. butt of Ollie, the joke, you're running. Yeah. Right. Um, any last thoughts before we wrap up? Any, ontology. Any... There we go. We've looked at ontology. We've looked at deductive arguments. We've looked yep. at the ontological argument, both different um, examples of it. We've looked at the criticisms of it, including um, Ganillo and the people, obviously, the people like Descartes, Kant. Mm-hmm. We've yep. gone from there to our own kind of criticism. We've looked at Hume um, and some more kind of modern examples of um, criticism of the ontological argument. It is an argument that has been discussed for. A very long time, hundreds yeah. of years. Um, you know, a thousand years, a thousand years, nearly a thousand actually, years. Yeah, nearly a thousand years. So obviously, Anselm came up with the argument. I mean, the the power of the gardener example that I used only came around in about 1944 as a reaction yeah. to the ontological argument. So even a th- nearly a thousand years later, we're still discussing this argument, um, the implications of it, um, and and yeah. And so I guess that speaks a lot in its favour that people are still talking about it thousands of a thousand years later. Thank you for listening to episode seven on the ontological argument. I've been your host, Jack Symes, and it's goodbye from the wonderful Mr. Andrew Horton. Thank you very much. And it's goodbye from the fantastic 
Mr. Fox. Goodbye. Make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes if you haven't done so already. The next episode will be on the teleological argument and will be out a week today. As you should know by now, a new episode is released every week on a Monday. Uh, if you follow us on Twitter at the Panpsychist, you can find out when episodes will be released. Get in touch with us. We'll always give you a shout out or just mock you or heckle you <laughs> on the interwebs. Um, all the reading, www.thepanpsychist.com forward slash panpsychast. Please give us as much feedback as possible. We are just three people sat in a room talking about philosophy, so it'd be quite nice if you have any questions or anything you'd like us to go into more detail, maybe at the start of the next episode, so just so we can kind of show the, the conversations and the ideas, um, you know, uh, and explain them in the best way possible. So any feedback would be greatly appreciated, and obviously any uh, recommendations in terms of topics you could throw our way, that'd be great too. So anything you want to know about, let us know, and we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do. Mm-hmm. And uh, just as the last thing, just if you could actually rate us on iTunes as well, I don't think we've actually said that enough because um, we've currently got a few, but it, it does actually help yeah, out the podcast it and it does allow us to kind of, well, we just get more listeners, more views and notice, uh, just, we go up the list of actual viewable and listenable podcasts and that yeah. just gains more attention. Yeah, the little, really great. the little likes and the, you know, the ratings you give us really make a massive difference. The more people that can listen to the podcast, the, the more the better they'll be. Um, Absolutely. See ya!